Welcome to the Med Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Matt Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Hey, podcast listeners, the year is winding down. The decade is winding down, but we got a great show for you today. Our guest is CIO of ACIA's Asset Management based out of Zurich, where he manages alternative investment funds for institutional and qualified investors. He's also written a lot of books, including Following the Trend, Diversified Managed Futures Trading, Stocks on the Move, and his new one, Trading Evolved. Anyone can build killer trading strategies in Python. Welcome to the show, Andreas Klanel. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. You know, last time I think we were hanging out would have been in New York City. I tried to take you to one of the finest Japanese restaurants and you said, no, 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 Meb, I'm ready for a burger. So we both had our first Shake Shack, our first Shake Shack adventure, and they just opened up one next door to my office now. So when you come visit me in LA, we don't even have to venture out. We can just go next door. Sure, I'd love to. I've never been over to, to California yet, but yeah, give me an excuse, I'll be there. Uh, I'll give you a lot of excuses. Although the big thing here now is the veggie burgers, the Impossible Burger, the Beyond Burger, which are probably just as bad for you, but... That's not helping me. That's not helping me. You, you, want, you want to give me a proper piece of meat if you want to get All it there. Right. <laughs> well, well uh, I've known you for a while. You've been um, one of my favorite authors and researchers, and uh, would love to dive in into a bunch of your books today including the, the newest one you have out. But I figured we'd start with the first book because this is one of my favorite books about a topic that is near and dear, I think, to both of our hearts, trend following. And you put this out. When, when did this come out? Like, it's not 10 years ago yet, is it? Maybe five? No, no, that was uh, late 2013. So, yeah, it's been a while, but not 10. And so this book called Following the Trend, maybe talk to us a little bit about it. Were you, how did you come to the appreciation or interest in trend following? You know, a lot of people kind of stumble upon it up different ways and many, <laughs> many have also have abandoned it over time. Uh, but how is it, how is it something that uh, popped up in, in, in interest for you? Yeah, I mean, starting to write the book was, uh, well, Bit of a hobby to begin with. I mean, not the trading per se. I was doing that for quite a while before. I was running some some CTA funds back then. But uh, the topic of writing a book about that came about when I was I was searching for good books on the topic. I found good books about you know people who did it before, about uh, about the industry, about famous people, and so on. But I didn't find anything good about you know how does it actually work. Nobody actually explained the details of what what is this thing and how does it work. How do you how do you build the strategies? How do they behave and why do they behave the way they do? And, I just had a crazy idea one day to start writing something. Uh, I think part of the inspiration from that came from a short research paper, I think it was three pages or something, from uh, one of the greats in the business, Nicole Kologian, over in, uh, at Quest Partners in, uh, in New York. He wrote a paper, like three, four pages, something like that, just explaining trend following. And I thought, this is spot on. Here's the first guy ever I thought. He wrote something that, that's brilliant. It just explains the whole business in a couple of sentences. I figured, you could do something properly with this. I mean, you could do something longer. You know, nobody reads a couple of page research paper for some reason. So, you know, what I did was I went ahead and I did a like 300 page research paper instead. And surprisingly, that became quite popular. I was as surprised as anybody over that. My God, you got some of the best gallery reviews, including uh, the one and only Market Wizards, Jack Swagger, talking about the book. But you start out with, kind of walk me through the book in general, you know, because it's really a, I wouldn't say it's a one-on-one -on -one level, how to build a trend following managed future sort of style strategy, but talk to us a little bit about how it all came together and about the, just the, the very basic framework and thesis behind what you wrote about in the book. Yeah. I just thought that the entire business was very much misunderstood for, for a lot of reasons, especially after the, the, uh, the stellar year of 2008. I say stellar year because the strategy per se, performed really, really well that year. Uh, as anybody who remember that year well, would say that even for those of us who had actually had good performance that year with these kind of strategies, it was nightmare years. So nobody wants that year, that year again, but it was a horror of a year. But afterwards, there was a lot of, was a lot of myths that came, out, came about about what this is and how it behaves, you know, why does it perform, 
when does it perform and not. So what, what I try to do is, I didn't try to build and show a model that is the best possible trend model in the world. That's not at all what the book is about. I, I tried to build a, what I call a, a middle of the road model, something average. It's not bad, it's not good, it's not, you know, it's okay, it works. And then I spent the entire book just explaining what is this thing, how does it work, what does it work, when does it work and not, and I believe the part that actually got attention, and that's the part I'm, I'm still kind of grateful for some of the bigger hedge funds but not suing me for, I did a reverse engineering chapter. So basically I took this very simple trend model that I built in the book. It's so simple that most people would look at that thinking that it's, it's, this, is, this is useless stuff. You know, obviously this nothing this simple could be used in hedge fund space, right? Then I used that model and I correlated it against the largest and most successful futures hedge funds in the world. And I showed that if you just toggle minor changes, just minor, minor changes back and forth, like you raise the risk, lower the risk, gear a bit more towards commodity or more towards financials, and you hit something like 0.7 to 0.9 correlation to the major CTA futures trend following hedge funds in the world. And these are very successful shops run by brilliant people. And what I tried to show is that it's, it's not that complicated, really. You can explain the performance using a simple model. You know, it's funny because this is probably my favorite chapter in the book. And I think you and I shared some laughs about it in person because so much of my belief, you know, a lot of the the big muscle movements of many strategies, not just trend following, but value investing or or many other ideas at their core don't seem all that complicated. And um, we like to make them sound complicated and really complex because that's easier to sell. But what, what was the response from a lot of the funds? Did they did they uh, love you for writing this book or hate you or send you bottles of champagne or what? Actually, not in retrospect, I can talk about it. It was a bit <laughs> amusing at the time. I, you know, After I finished writing the book, I had a uh, publishing contract. Uh, I had an offer on the table and not signed yet from an American publishing house. I gave another thought. I, you know, I looked through what I wrote. I named funds. I did all of this reverse engineering where I basically show that, you know, some of these billion dollar hedge funds do very simple stuff and, you know, charge two and 20 for it. I realized maybe some of these guys kind of lack the sense of humor about, you know, about all of this. And of course, you guys know, uh, America is somewhat litigation happy in, at, at times. I think, you know, I've got to take some steps to protect myself just in case. And I, I kind of hardened my structure. I made sure that I was very difficult to sue. And then I changed my legal structure on the um, uh, on the book contract I signed with a British publishing house to so further protect myself. In retrospect, it turns out all of this was overly paranoid. Uh, the one fund I was mostly worried about, I'm not going to say which one here, but uh, uh, the one fund I, I worried the most about having uh, being a bit sore about it, they called me up after the book came out. Uh, the CEO called me up. He uh, said he's coming by Zurich. He wanted to have a, have a meeting, have a chat. And, you know, I said, I love the book. He wanted to explain that I was right. And he wanted to explain why, basically, their side of it. And made a great call. I mean, obviously, to be slightly cynical here, it kind of helps if you're an allocator in the business, right? If you're in a position to allocate money to hedge funds, then they have less of an incentive to, to you know, to, to start, start a fight with you. But... I think everybody took it great. Uh, I had no negative comments from any of the hedge funds, and I was paranoid at the time, but it turned out well. I loved it, and I'm looking forward to you eventually doing an update one day because I would love to see uh, how these hold up out of sample too. But let's take a step back, you know, because I think a lot of the listeners, trend following means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and you and I probably have a pretty good understanding of of what we say when we mean it. But maybe talk a little bit about a trend following portfolio in general, what that looks like to you as both a practitioner and an allocator. You feel free to use some of the strats from the book. And the jumping off point I'd like to start with is a quote you have in the book. And it's something that we talk a lot about, which is particularly after 2008, a lot of people saw benefits of a trend following strategy that prior had not really thought about it and then kind of got the opposite side of a trend following strategy afterwards. And so you say trend following trades fail most of the time, but that's okay. Trend following tends to have a fairly large amount of losing trades, often as high as 70%. And it's not a strategy for those who like to be proven right all the time. So maybe uh, maybe jump off from there and just talk to us a little bit about how you see 
trend following as portfolio in general? Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing to understand is that trend following is very much a portfolio strategy. In my view, to run trend following model on a single market is, is, is just luck. It's just begging to, to, to get hit badly. Trend following is basically, basically about taking a lot of bets on, very, on a very large number of markets independently. So you see something starting to move in one direction, you jump on the bandwagon in that direction. So you see gold going up, for instance. I mean, obviously, you have to formulate mathematical rules about this, but the logic is more or less that you see something moving, gold or oil or something starts moving. If it moves up, you buy. Moves down, you go short. And now you just wait. If it turns around, it goes against you, you close up, you have a small loss. That happens almost all the time. Over 70% of the time, you, you take a small loss, it's annoying, you keep losing, 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 small losses. But once in a while, it just continues. Once in a while, you get the big move. And that big move is going to pay for a lot of the losers. And the problem here is that if we do this on one or two markets, you can have this period for a long time where you just keep losing. And you can keep losing until your portfolio is gone. But if you do this on a lot of different markets, especially a diversified market, that is, you trade everything from from gold, soybeans, uh, to bonds, to currencies, uh, equity markets, trade everything in the same way with the same rules. There will, or historically anyway, there will almost all the time be something that keeps moving and that pays for the losing trades. So in my view, it, it's, a, it's a game about large numbers. You have to repeat the experiment over and over again. You have a slightly higher probability than average, and you just keep rolling the dice. And the nice thing you do in the book, which I think is really interesting, useful for a practitioner is you do sort of a year by year walkthrough. Because, you know, a lot of people you tell them on paper, yeah, you can have multiple losing trades in a row. And then they have those losing trades in a row. And they're like, forget it. This is my system's broken, or they want to mess with it, or they think, you know, trend following is dead. And you kind of walk through that year by year and show kind of how these trades play out. I think that's a really useful exercise. Uh, Do you even recall and I'm blanking on it because it's been a while since I read the book, but I remember some of the strategies you published were so simple in their rules. One of them I feel like was literally like, is the market up or down in like the last year or something? It was it was like the simplest rule on the planet. I can't remember if that was the one in the book or something you wrote about on your blog, but do you remember the kind of strategy design from uh, from the book? Yeah. Yeah. Um... The one you mentioned, actually, I published it much, much later. Uh, first on my website, I believe, but I also wrote about it in, uh, in my latest book. I, I had a, that is an example in there. But in the book, I spent, I'd say, 80% of the book. It's been a while since I read it myself, but uh, I guess 80% or so of the book is about one single strategy, which is quite simple. It's, it's a moving average breakout model, basically. A trend filter with a, with a breakout, uh, which is not terribly complex stuff, but the trick, as I, as I explained in the book, is about diversification. The trick is not in the rules themselves. I mean, most people are focusing too much on the rules. They're staring at the entry-exit rules as if that is the most important thing. And for some type of strategies, entry and exit rules are actually important. For trend following, not so much. I mean, how many times, uh, how, how many different ways can you follow trends, really? Uh, the, the rules themselves are not too important in terms of engine and exit. The rules are important when it comes to the diversification and the risk management, of course. I, I think this is a really insightful comment you just made because, um, you know, what do people spend 90% of their time thinking about, particularly when younger, uh, but also even a lot of allocators, I think, is, is these concepts of what do you use to get in? Uh, what do you use? Like, what, what are the very specific system when so much of the performance in many ways, because it's going to be dominated by these really, really big, massive trends and in long term, uh, huge gains, power laws in many ways, like almost like a venture capital portfolio. So much of it comes down to, uh, you know, the, the position sizing and how you build the portfolio. Maybe talk about a little bit about that, because I know Having heard you give speeches in the past, risk management and position sizing is something uh, you've had a lot to say about uh, in, uh, in, in, and have a lot of idea, ideas about. Yeah, I mean, the, the risk part especially is something that I, I 
like speaking about in conferences, uh, particularly when it comes to more retail oriented conferences, because the thing with the retail oriented conferences, if you say things that are dead obvious in the institu institutional space, something that everybody who works in the business knows. And if I say it on a more retail conference, people are shocked. I say the biggest misunderstanding from people who, who don't work in the business, who are trading as a hobby is what risk is and how to measure it, how much to take. Just a general understanding of risk. That, that's a, the biggest thing they can improve on. And I'd say risk, summarize, risk is a matter of valuation change or say value change per unit of time or potential value change per unit of time. If those components are not in, it's not risk. Uh, common question I, I got after writing the book was, yeah, but how many percent do we risk per trade? My first reaction was, well, what do you mean? Percent per what? Per, per day? Per year? What are we talking about? I, I wasn't even exposed to some of these concepts before about risk per trade. I find to be a, a misunderstanding of what risk is. The same thing goes with uh, things like pyramiding and all of this um, retail oriented, this, this um, uh, so-called money, money management things. Most of those things are gambling methods that have no basis in mathematics, no basis in, in finance. Basically, thing to keep in mind is it's about value variation per unit of time. And it's not, if that's not in your equation, then it's not risk. So that's on the measuring side. And the other thing is, of course, how much are we to take? And that goes hand in hand with how much are you aiming for? How much, what kind of return are you aiming for? Because you cannot get free return in this business. It's not possible. If you want to have higher return, you've got to take higher risk. You know, skill level only gets you so far. You can you can slightly tweak the equation. You can get slightly slightly more return for slightly less risk. But we're talking small things. You know, if you're going to aim for high returns, you have to aim for high risk. And understanding of this is the key thing, in my view, to understanding finance. Yeah, and I, I think along the same lines is also the understanding of expectations. You know, I've heard you speak about this before too, where uh, certainly a lot of retail and individual investors. When you speak to them, and even in many cases, some institutions too, you talk about what's possible or feasible about what they expect from their portfolio returns. And many people, the expectations are, dare we say it, like a bit optimistic? Yeah, there's a, there's a difference in, in a way. I mean, yes, I agree that some institutions have too high risk targets. That's true. But then we're talking about different, different scale here, very different scale. Uh, we're talking about... Say so hobby traders who have a different, who have a, a slightly skewed perception of, of risk, there's an order of magnitude difference. I was speaking at a conference a couple of years ago where I realized later that, that many of them had, they came from the same school of thought for various reasons. And I started asking around at the uh, drink session at the conference, but what, what kind of return targets do you have? And the first guy told me uh, 20%. And that seemed to be something that everybody nodded and agreed on. And while I was just starting to explain that 20% per year is kind of not entirely realistic of the time, then somebody pointed out that I misunderstood. They meant 20% per week. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, I said, you know, have you tried taking 1.2 to the power of 52 and multiplying by your trading account? And <laughs> you know, I was stuck in that conversation for quite a while, explaining that if you get 20% a week, then quit whatever you're doing and do that because you know nobody in history has done even a fraction of that. You're going to make uh, Bezos look like Bozo in, in, in a year. I mean, you, you can buy your Caribbean island in a year and a half. You know, you can start your own little nation somewhere with that money. But that is the difference. You know, a retail traders waiting for, I mean, in this case was ridiculous. Of course, 20% per week is, is, um, is beyond magic. But say, even if you aim for 100% a year over time, I mean, any given year, anything can happen, right? I mean, 100% a year in one year is completely possible. But if you're aiming to spend a decade doubling your money every year, well, you're going to be one of the richest people in the world if you're able to do that. I mean, we talked about that a lot where our buddy Wes Gray had, had written a piece called something like, you know, even God would get fired as an active manager because hmm. um, one, looking at just, I mean, if you compound at 20% a year, you, which is essentially what Buffett's done, you eventually become one of the richest people in the world if you can do it and continue to do it. And that's the challenge. But But the flip side for a lot of people is that that comes with fairly large 
drawdowns, and you mentioned Bezos, I mean, this is a perfect example because there's been multiple times where Amazon stock has gone down 90%. And a lot of people can't sit through that. I mean, and Buffett and Berkshire talk about, look, if you can't sit through 50% decline in quoted securities, you shouldn't be in the stock market. And the same thing, of course, applies to our world as well. Talk to me a little bit about I know you're not just a trend follower, but we're still on the topic. Talk to me a little bit about trend following and you know, someone who's been involved in this world for a long time, seen a few different cycles. How has your perspective or approach or anything else changed over the years? Is there any sort of beliefs you may have had a decade ago that you no longer or any sort of insights that you think have been additive? What's uh, any general takeaways? The biggest lesson I probably learned over the past, I don't know, I, I try to think back how many years I've been in the business, but it just makes me depressed. I'm older than I, older than I look, as you know. I think the biggest thing I've come to realize is that it's not about the strategy as much as it is about the business. And the business has certainly changed a lot. I have the greatest respect for these few guys. There are a few guys in this business, uh, only a handful, who actually continue to do the same exact thing since, well, 80s or, or at least early 90s. That's not entirely good for business, I believe, because you have to separate, right? There's a business side and there's a strategy side, and they're not necessarily connected in any way. Clearly, the business side benefits from having good results, but you've got to follow the business side. And the business, well, trend following has become commoditized. I don't actually mean that as a pun. Uh, we do trade commodities here, but what I mean is when I started doing trend following, it was still a fairly small strategy. Obviously, I wasn't part of the, uh, the the big gold rush of the early days with uh, when uh, Eckhart and Dennis and these guys got the whole ball rolling. But even when I got in, it was still a fairly small strategy. Anybody can, anybody could set something up. You show good results, you raise money, you build a business out of it. And I'm I'm the first one to admit I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to get in when I did. But now. Is commoditized. That is, can you imagine someone today saying, I have, I have a startup idea. I'm going to start a, a mutual fund. You know, I can do slightly better than, than the big players. And I'm going to have a mutual fund and I'm, I'm going to raise billions for my mutual fund. Nobody's going to take you seriously, right? Mutual fund is owned by, I mean, the whole business is owned by the large banks. It's, called, it's become a brand name marketing gig. You know, it's like bringing out your own brand of, of, uh, of toothpaste. Nobody's going to take you seriously. The big guys own that business. The same thing happened with trend following. Now, it's more or less a brand name thing. You know, it's a business model. I don't know, it changed. All the, all the big inflows are coming to the large funds. That was not the case 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so you got to look at where can you add some value in the business. I mean, if you're doing it as, as, as business, of course, if you're trading your own money, a different story. You know, do whatever works, whatever makes money. But if you're looking to build a business, you got to be different. You can't just run a trend following model like everybody else. Even if you say that you're slightly better than this billion dollar hedge funds over there, well, sure, but why should I invest in you? So that part has changed a lot. You know, I think you hit on a, something we talk about a lot, which is I think a lot of younger people see the, I hesitate to use the word sexy, but the maybe they watch the uh, billions or, you know, one of these shows that really makes trading look like this fantastic, and it is a highly rewarding career, whether it's in equities or trend following or anything else. And, and trend followings has this allure because you're using words like futures or leverage and margin and it harkens back to the trading trading places day of the cowboys trading hogs or oil or wheat or whatever it may be. But the very real flip side that you, I think, very accurately describe is we often say that managing money and the business of managing money are two completely different things and skill sets and approaches. And uh, I think a lot of what we've learned over the years is so much of asset management business is about narratives and storytelling and relationships for better or for worse. But you certainly, from a pure quant standpoint, see a lot of strategies, asset managers out there that most would say are kind of garbage, <laughs> but still manage a gazillion dollars. So, uh, so it, it's it's something that I think is is important to distinguish between the two. As someone who's been both a practitioner and allocator, talk to us a little bit about how you see a managed futures or trend following allocation fit into 
a sleeve of a portfolio. So if you're talking to an institution or a family office or even an individual who says, look, you know, I'm, I want to put together this portfolio, how do you kind of describe where it fits in? Well, I think trend following should be part of a larger portfolio. I, I think it's, it should be one of the core building blocks of a larger portfolio. We've seen over time that trend following tends to perform very well in high volatility environments. Uh, that is uh, the old classic um, uh, tail hedge model. No guarantees, of course, but uh, during uh, severe bear, bear, bear markets, during times when financial markets are under stress, trend following tends to do quite well. I'm not one of those who would say, put all your money in trend following. No way, don't put, your all, don't put all your money in anything. You should diversify your portfolio across a lot of strategies. Uh, what we would do is we buy a lot of different hedge fund strategies as well as traditional assets. And we, we, we build a portfolio that should work under, under any type of climate. But uh, trend following, I mean, what we've seen here is, first of all, I mean, obviously the elephant in the room, uh, trend following return has gone down over the past decade or so. Not terribly surprising. I don't expect to see any kind of returns we saw 15, 20 years ago. That's not realistic, not on these kind of yield levels. But we have not seen any sign that it stops working. We have not seen any sign that it would perform worse than equity markets. I mean, equity market is still one of the worst asset classes. If you do, if you look at, uh, if you look at the volatility adjusted returns over time on buy and hold equities, it's still one of the worst looking ones. You, you should still have equities, of course. I'm not saying you should avoid equities. I mean, but- I say that that's that's a hot take. I want to I want to hear you dive a little more into that because uh, you you just probably exploded the brains of half the listenership right now. <laughs> equities show return over time. You should have an equity portfolio. Everybody should have an equity portfolio. But you should also be aware that you know if you look over a say 30, 40 year, 30, 40 year period, and I'm talking total return, of course, with dividends included. You're looking at a uh, an expected return of say between five to seven percent, perhaps annualized uh, over time. And for that, you're looking at occasional drawdowns of say well 50, 60 percent now and then. I mean, we had two of those in the in the, in the past couple of decades uh, during my career. There were two of those. Volatility levels are quite high. You have sudden shocks. You know, if you enter at the wrong time, it takes a long time for you to get compensated for that. You know, if you buy the the uh, top of a bubble. At the moment, you know, I'm, I'm not one to time the markets here. I, I don't think that's a useful uh, use of your time. But uh, at the moment, we had one of the longest running bull markets in history. And, you know, it would be reasonable to assume that sooner or later that's going to end with a larger correction. If you start building an equity exposure before a larger correction, it might take a decade or so before you actually get your money back. So equity is, is a difficult asset class. Both because of the uh, the performance of the of the indices over time, I mean, you can argue that the construction of the indices is part of the problem, and I I'd, I'd be inclined to agree on that. Uh, but the other big problem with equities is that stocks are stocks, and they perform very similarly. You know, if you buy a basket of fifty stocks, you're still mostly long beta, right? You're still just long equities. They're all going to tank at the same time. They're difficult. You know, I, I think you a good example is we see portfolios so many times where they come to us and, you know, they say, hey, I'm diversified and their portfolio is U.S. large cap growth, U.S. large cap value, U.S. mid cap growth, U.S. mid cap value, U.S. small cap growth, U.S. small cap value. And they say, look, I have thousands of stocks. I go, congratulations, you just bought the S&P 500, you know, which in, in and of itself, like you mentioned, is a portfolio of stocks. And and the same thing, I was actually at a conference recently and we were talking about how we thought a lot of the foreign markets are cheaper than the US. And they said, well, Meb, you know, so you're saying that if you buy emerging markets, that's going to protect if the US goes down. And I said, no, I would fully expect if the US goes down 50 or 80, that emerging markets would also go down 50 or 80, because in the gen- in general, there's still stocks and there are different stocks, but it's not the same as having a managed futures account where you know, you got stuff that has quite a bit less correlation. So you mentioned they're they're not one of your favorites. What are your other favorite asset classes or or strategies that you would uh, you would consider? I think it's dangerous to have a favorite. I mean, you know, I favorite like wrong word. Price. Favorite wrong word. You said you said you stocks are not one of the. Yes. What else would you consider to put in a portfolio? And and if you say you're putting it all in local Swiss 
minus one percent bonds, you're you're really oh. gonna go, just turn everyone crazy. <laughs> Actually, I think uh, it's not minus one anymore. It's like minus a half, right? Yeah. Or what that, are they that, yielding? That's... That's a totally weird, weird topic, of course. Yes, well, we do have negative yields over here. We had for quite some time now. That, that's, a, that's a weird one, yes. Unfortunately, you don't get paid for taking a mortgage on your house. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you, need, you need a diversification of your portfolio. And obviously, it depends on your goals here. I mean, some people are more focused towards uh, capital growth, uh, wealth generation. Other people are more focused on well, capital protection, that is, you know, protecting your wealth. So it all depends on what situation you're in, you know, how much money you have, and if you're aggressive in growth, or if you're more concerned about not losing what you have. Uh, if you have a large enough portfolio, my view is you should have a big mix. Yeah, you should have you should have probably substantial allocation to equities in general. Uh, hopefully, something actively managed by somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, you should probably have an allocation to various type of hedge funds. I like uh, private equity hedge funds at the moment. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting things going on in the, in the private equity space at the moment. You should probably have a real estate portfolio. I mean, you know, obviously I'm coming from the institutional side, and now we have people at home sitting there thinking that who 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 is this guy who says I should go buy real estate and hedge funds for my my salary? That's not possible. What I'm saying here is not possible for people who don't already have a fair chunk of cash to to allocate. Obviously, but maybe you can invest in a manager who can do it for you. Who can you know, you can participate in a vehicle where it's some sort of pool ve- pooled vehicle where you can participate in these kind of things. Diversification gets easier the larger portfolios you handle, basically. And sometimes when we work in the business, we uh, kind of lose track of the fact that the rather substantial portfolios that we handle might not be the portfolios that the average person out there is, is you know, is, is looking to allocate. Is there anything you think that fits into a portfolio? And we're going off topic a bit, which is fine. We'll come back in a minute. Uh, Anything in particular that you think is interesting that fits into a portfolio that most others would consider doesn't? So, because you and I are trend followers and we appreciate that allocation. I mean, we probably have one of the largest trend following allocations to our default asset allocation portfolios here of anyone I know. Most of the people that I ever talk to they say, I'll put 5% in trend following managed futures. You know, I, I don't know of an institution that has ever allocated more than 20. Maybe, maybe there are some. If they are, they're, they're certainly outliers. But, and you can answer that question if you want, but also, are there any other strategies like trend following that you think are interesting that most allocators don't allocate to, or if they do, it's you know a, a tiny thing, or, or one that you love that's maybe somewhat untraditional? Uh, I mentioned the private equity space is something I like. Uh, there are various, type, various types of return or oh, absolute return type of strategies, even in the equity markets. Uh, there are strategies that are, are that are either 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 have a variable exposure level or a uh, delta neutral st- type of strategy that is that is that they're not depending on whether the stock markets are going up and down. Usually, with this type of strategies, you get a lower return but a more stable return. And I I kind of like this type of managers because you get a stable base, a cornerstone in the portfolio, something that keeps performing at a fairly low level, but it keeps performing up and down with the stock market. I also, well, I, I, I've also been, uh, I think you know about this before, Meb, uh, we are, we have been quite active for the past 10 years or so in the, in the, um, in the alternative lending space, business to business lending space in the United States. So we, we, um, we've been quite active over there. So we'd had some pretty nice success with, with strategies and ventures in, in that kind of space. And that's an area I think is is growing at the moment. Talk to us a little bit about that, because that's something we haven't spent a lot of time exploring on the podcast. So uh, what do you mean by alternative lending for the listeners and uh, kind of how do you guys approach it? Uh, basically, it's a matter of alternative credit. Uh, what we do is we have securitized in Europe some American type, American-based ventures that offer credit to American businesses. Uh, we're talking medium-term credit for medium, more or less medium-sized companies. So less than a year credit for established but not very large companies. And these type of companies, uh, the problem for them is that they cannot find loan from. They just won't get loans from American banks. After 2008, after the credit crunch, American banks left the scene. They left a big vacuum behind them where. Basically, the American businesses are unable to lend to, to loan money. Uh, so we, we and many others like us, offer um, credit to those companies. 
this was uh, what we are doing uh, started like a, started with the type of PE uh, that is a private equity venture that we later securitized. But we found for the past 10 years it's been going really well. We have we have seen that the, the type of yields you can find in that space are quite attractive, totally non-correlated. It's just something different. You know, we, we always look for different type of solutions. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we, we were in, uh, in salt water disposal, you know, looking at, uh, uh, we had a place over in Arizona to, to clean water after, after fracking operations, which was quite a nice business when the oil price was higher. Uh, it's just an example of, of different things that we do on the uh, on more of the private equity side of, of, the, of the firm where we look for interesting things here and there. Clearly, this is not something that, you know, the average listener can go out and, you know, go out and start or, or uh, build a business around. But just to mention, you know, there's always interesting business ideas around and sometimes they can grow into something of, you know, something that, that matters. You know, it's it's uh, you touch on something that has always been fascinating to me, which is a lot of these asset classes or strategies or approaches that, like you said, have no correlation to anything else. And by definition, many of them are hard to scale or they may be pretty niche you know, even something like catastrophe bonds, it may be complicated, it may have low liquidity, uh, but things that really have no uh, correlation to really anything else in the, uh, in the portfolio. I, I want to hop back to trend for one more minute, and then we'll continue on to some other stuff. One, one of the things that I think uh, interests people is trend following in a traditional managed futures world is set up as a long and short opportunity set. And many people are very comfortable with a long or long flat sort of approach, but shorting starts to get uncomfortable. Could you talk a little bit about, one, how you see shorting fitting into the allocation, if it's something that is also necessary? Because some people say, no, 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 if I had to do managed futures, I'll just do it long flat. Uh, so maybe talk a little bit about that and see what... Uh, I want to hear your opinion. Sure. I mean, first, I'd like to say that, just to be clear, uh, we're talking about futures and not equities, because I, I see them as totally different subjects on, on this particular instance. But for futures and trend following, it's a tough call, because if you model it, you'll see that you can probably get high returns over time if you just do the long side. So it looks attractive on paper. Just skip the short side. You can keep trading the long and short over over a decade, and you look back at 10 years and see that on the short side, I net lost money. And it's easy, easy here to draw the, draw the conclusion that we should just stop doing it. But it's not that easy. The short side in conjunction with the long side, if you trade them both at the same time, it will have a negative correlation. What you're looking at in the end is the overall combined strategy will, it, will return a better risk-adjusted return. Because you just you decrease your volatility by adding this this is negatively correlated strategy. What that means in, in plain English is that at stress times, at times when the long only trend following really takes a hit, that's when the short side really performs, and it it lessens the the, the negative performance. It smooths smooths out the performance, and it gives you a more attractive return curve over the long run. That's an interesting point that a lot of people outside the business are missing as well, that sometimes when you're building a product, usually in a product there are many different strategies or at least several strategies combined into one product. Each of the strategies need to contribute, of course, but they don't necessarily need to have an attractive positive return. They can even have a negative return if they have a sufficient negative correlation to the other part of the portfolio. You know, as I said, in the end, it's about risk adjusted return, not just return. There are, no, there are no prices for getting the highest possible return in a year. That's not how the business works. You win by having the best risk-adjusted return. I think that's an important point. You know, We often say that long-short is a, such a great diversifier because often it's when things are hitting the fan. But the long-flat, if I had to choose one personally for my entire portfolio, if you said, Meb, you had to do your entire portfolio with one, I would actually choose long flat, but but long short as a diversifier, I think makes a lot of sense. You mentioned equities as a reference. Your second book talked about equities, which I thought you haven't seen a lot of research. Have you seen a lot of academic research, which is borderline un unreadable about momentum? You haven't seen as much as people talking about it in terms of trend. Maybe talk a little bit about how you think about, are there any opportunities to uh, implement 
equities with a trend or momentum approach. And with a nod earlier, you said that indices aren't particularly well designed. Uh, any insight there too uh, would be interesting. This is actually how the how, how the second book came around or came about. Uh, what happened was after my first book, I got a lot of questions about stocks. People read the first book. They said, yeah, this sounds great on, on futures, but you know, on futures, you need to have pretty substantial bit of cash to start going, start, start trading. So, so many people emailed me and asked the same question. Can we do the same thing on stocks? And my answer was, no, not really. If you do it on stocks, you got to do it differently. Uh, and this became such a common question that I figured, you know what, let's just write a book about it. And I tried to keep the terminology clean. I, I tried to use a different terminology to show the difference that I mean, uh, that, that I think is important here. What I said in the book was that basically trend following doesn't work for stocks, but momentum does. And it's a very similar concept. Stocks are different. You've got to treat it differently. The key thing in trend following, as I mentioned before, is diversification. If you can trade everything from, from, from cattle to palladium to, to bonds, then you have diversification. But with stocks, no, not so much. If you try to do, try doing trend following on stocks, you're just going to pile up massive amounts of beat down. And if you don't realize that you're building a beta portfolio, you know, if you build a beta portfolio on purpose, it's fine. But if you build a beta portfolio by accident, you will have a rude, rude awakening when the market turns, right? So I, I wrote the second book with that in mind. I tried to explain the difference between trend following and momentum. Uh, the big thing with momentum really is that you've got to take into account the state of the entire stock market. You cannot realistically expect to make money buying stocks in a, in a bear market. And shorting stocks, well, sure, there are experts who are very good at that, more short-term oriented, but to run, say, a medium long-term strategy that uh, that remains short stocks for weeks or months, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, you asked about the construction of indices. And yeah, sure, I mean, if you look at, if you look at the S&P 500 as your, your market gauge there, uh, but if, if you look at that to, to see what is the stock market doing, you got to understand that the S&P 500, well, it has 500 stocks in theory, but only the top 20 or so matter. It's market cap weighted, meaning that the larger a company is, so the, the, the higher the, um, the value of a company, the higher the weight in the index. And the top 20 companies or so, they dominate the index. The rest are just, just a rounding error. It's, it's a bit ridiculous to pretend that five, there's 500 stocks in there when... You have some stocks that have, uh, what is it now, 5% plus for the, for, the, for the top, and the lowest, what, 0.001%. The bottom few hundred don't matter. So there's no diversification in there, and that's a big problem with the index. Uh, try an experiment here. Uh, try, try buying the same 500 stocks. Build a simple back test. Buy the same 500 stocks, but do it uh, equal weighted. I certainly don't recommend equal weighted, but it's, it's a lot better than, uh, than market cap weighted. And what you'll see is that over time, it outperforms quite nicely. We, we say market cap weighting, while a interesting innovation in the 1970s, the innovation was actually not market cap weighting, but lower fees versus the higher fee stuff. And almost any other weighting methodology tends to outperform over the market cap starting point. Let's get to your new book. You didn't learn your lesson, Andreas. You you wrote a book and then another one. And then you said, I, I like torture. I can't help myself. I'm going to write a third. I think I've quit at this point. I'm not sure. It's it's too painful. But you said, I got to write another one. And you put out a new book. Talk to us about it. What's uh, what's, the, what's the new one out? Uh, the latest book is very different. I figured I did two books that are reasonably similar. In my first book about future, second book about stocks. They're very similar in style and structure. It's like a clear sequel. And generally, I don't like sequels. Uh, who wants the next big movie franchise? For instance, they add a number to something or they change the name slightly and it's more or less the same. So I, I figured I got to do something different this time. What do you and, mean? We're we getting ready to have, I think, like the 10th or 11th, no, like 11th or 12th Star Wars film come out, <laughs> unless you're oh, Disney. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. I was a big fan of that until um, until the fourth came out. And I... Do mean the fourth that chronologically came up. What it boils, boils down to, I guess, is the target audience of my books. I, I started thinking about that a while back, but I, I got a question. I can't even remember who asked me the question. What, what were my, my target audience of my books? And I, I thought about it and I, I came up with the answer. And that actually, actually explains why I write the books I do. 
my target audience is myself, 10 to 20 years earlier. So basically, I tried to write books that would have helped me a lot if I had found a book when I was less experienced, when I was younger, when I didn't already know the stuff. If I could have find could have, could, if I could have found a book like that, it would have helped me a lot. That that's my starting point. I'm the target audience when I was younger. So I figured, what's the best thing? What what should I have learned? Like I don't know, 20 years ago or something. Proper back testing, proper uh, proper programming of back test, the tech side. So I figured uh, now I got a kind of a locked audience, right? P people seem to have liked the first two books. I don't know why, but they seem to have liked them, right? So I got kind of a built-in audience. So let's see if I can trick these people into reading a tech book, because these are people who probably wouldn't buy a tech book normally. But you know, hey, maybe I can get them to to read one, and I can you know show them, put them in a false sense of security until they realize that they're halfway through a tech book and now they've got to continue. So what I did with the third one is, it's a very practical book. It's, to my knowledge, it's a type of book that, well, at least I'm not aware of, and it's and a similar type of book out there. It's focusing on how to use a programming language called Python to build back tests of trading strategies. And the point is that anybody who reads it, who spends enough time takes it seriously, learns it. I don't care what kind of tech background you're at. If you never programmed in your life before, shouldn't matter, I hope. The point is you should be able to, to, after this book, to test your own strategies, to actually formulate your strategies, test them, build it, run it, run the, run the math, and see what comes out. Does your strategy work or not? What, uh, and, and it clocks in at well over 400 pages. You know, I think this is a perfect prelude to just becoming Clonal the professor. You know, huh. you go, <laughs> that's, that's the that real pay? money, man. You <laughs> update this every year and this uh, this becomes your textbook for uh, oh. the rest of your career. Well, Matt, you've written a few books yourself. So um, I think, you, you, I think you, you know as well that I, I think most listeners should be aware as well that if you want to write books and make money, there are only a few select topics and... Uh, since I know very little about wizards and vampires, I make very tiny money on books, but like like almost all authors out there. Well, it's good, you know, and it's funny because I feel like so many, and I've heard you speak to this as well, so many, and it may be a generational thing, but so many young investors, they start with a lot of the technical analysis books, they start with the coding to try to optimize some sort of intraday currency trading to where they again can make 20% per week and they throw 500 variables in so that they find a system that that works. But I thought yours was particularly thoughtful. Are there any um, sort of examples or takeaways from the book that you think are interesting for people that are considering uh, uh, taking it for a spin? Well, I tried to mix it. There are some trading ideas in there. So I have some both. I use both the, the trading models from my previous two books. And I use new trading models with hopefully new concepts. So there's new stuff from the pure trading angle. But I mainly use that to get people to understand the, uh, the core topic of the book, which is learn to do it yourself. So I would say the big takeaway here is, well, trust but verify. And this book helps you to verify. You know, somebody tells you strategy works. You know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But your default view should be that it probably doesn't. So let's sit down and test it. Does it work or not? Uh, I want to give you the tools to do this yourself. That, that's that's what the book is about. To so test test your own ideas, test what people claim, test what people tell you. If you read another book about trading, they they give you some some rules or something in there. Well, you know, this gives you a tool set to replicate it to test what happens if you trade it. You know, it's funny because I am. Um came to much of what our my career has become on on quant side of the business from frustration with reading a lot of the books out there that made a lot of claims about this happens and this is what happens in the future and this is a bullish setup or sign or system or whatever without really any systematic underpinnings and frustration with, I mean, just countless dozens, if not hundreds of books, you know, with without any substance. And then I certainly wish this was 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 around a long time ago. Did you self-publish this or was this with traditional publisher? I did actually. I have some insight on that as well, if, you, if you're interested. Yeah. So I, I got a bit of a shock when I got into the whole publishing world. First, I 
I read about how to get a book published. I read about how incredibly difficult it is. And that's probably true if you're publishing a novel. Probably. I don't know. I haven't tried one yet. But first, I, I had multiple publishers who pretty much accepted my book right away, which was very surprising to me. I was feeling very good about that until I realized that uh, publishing a finance book is, is surprisingly easy. Then you start looking at the terms and conditions and you realize, okay, nobody gets rich writing books. I, I think actually, uh, you know, I, I hate name dropping, but Jack Schwager once told me that as far as he knows, there's only one person in the world who can actually make a living from writing finance books and it's not him. I'll leave it to you to figure out who it is. It should be obvious, I think. But if you look at the economics of publishing a book with a major publishing house, you see that it is bordering on the ridiculous. I mean, yeah, sure, you don't expect to get much paid, but you don't expect to give away, you know, pretty much everything to some other company, right? Then you realize what exactly do the publisher do for you? Maybe I had a bad experience, maybe I had a, maybe I got unlucky, but my view after my first book was I'm giving away pretty much all the money and I did all the work. I even, even designed the cover. I did all the marketing. Uh, no marketing was done for the book. Uh, I, I just couldn't see the value at in the end. So I did an experiment with the second book. I self-published the second book, and I figured, you know, I did all the work on the first one, right? I sold as many as I did on the first one, and, well, not that it's, I don't know how to express that. It's, it's actually not enormous money in any way or shape or form, but at least it felt like it's fair compensation for writing the book. So I did the same thing on the third one, uh, self-published via, via Amazon, via CreateSpace. I checked with a couple of publishers. I had a couple of publishers who were interested, but again, the terms and conditions are, you know, as a businessman, I, it, feels, it feels wrong to do that, to be honest. Uh, if you can get the same distribution on your own, then why not do that? Technology, the technology and the, the platforms for this has increased incredibly over the past decade. The world has changed so fast with how it operates. And like you mentioned, um, trend following and power laws exist in, in so many areas where the big winners are often magnitude more than uh, the long tail of everything else. But talk to us a little bit about your website. You throw up some uh, articles on there, some resources. Uh, you've been publishing for a long time. Uh, I don't know if you can call it a blog anymore in 2019, but where do people go in the, to find a little more about what you're writing about there and what's, uh, what's on? What's on? I, I should probably write some more articles. I've been, too, I've been too busy writing books and things. And uh, the website is really, I say it's, a, it's a hobby project I started some years ago. It was actually a fellow author who told me, you know, when I was almost done with the first book, uh, an established author in the field gave me some advice. Some of it was, was great. Some of it I, I backtracked on later. He told me, uh, one, start a web page, write articles, write a blog, basically. That didn't feel right, but that at least, you know, that, that worked out. I, I had a lot of uh, interesting interaction there. I wrote a lot of articles and people seemed to enjoy it. Uh, he also told me, join Facebook, Twitter, and a long list of other things. And I left most of those things afterwards. I, I think I still have a Twitter account, which... You know, if you send me a message, message on Twitter, I'll probably never see it because I never log into the thing. Uh, that part, I'm not sure. Maybe you got to have it, but um, that's why I started the webpage anyway. And I write, I write articles when I when I have a moment, when I have some time. It's more of a hobby, but it's it's been sparse lately due to writing. Well, we'll, we'll link to some of the articles on there in the show notes. Uh, listeners, mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. There's some good articles, how to be a professional trader and some others that we probably don't have time for today. Trading sardines is another nice one. What, uh, what else are you working on these days now that this book is put to bed out of your brain as you look to the horizon in 2020 and beyond? Is there anything that's scratching an itch in your head other than negative interest rates, other than chatting up managers? Is there anything particular on your brain that either you're working on or you're curious about? Well, there's always a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I, I'm, some people are incredibly focused. Some people have a laser focus, they do one thing, they do it incredibly well, and all their energy goes to this one thing. I have the highest respect for this type of people, but not one of them. I like to do a lot of different things. And all of these things, I mean, most of the visible stuff, really, that you see from me are my hobby projects. And, you know, you've got to have your hobbies. And I do confess that I'm actually looking at on my screen at the moment about 300-page manuscripts started this summer. 
I have no idea yet if it's going to turn out to be anything that's actually going to be published or yet another manuscript I, I end up deleting and I had fun writing it. But I do have something in the pipeline in a way. So um, it's, it's, all I can say about that one is that it's going to be an extremely different book. Uh, not, 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 nothing remotely similar to anything you've seen before, if it does finalize, of course. And, and investing uh, mystery romance novels are a very small niche. Andreas. That's that that that's a good one. That's a good one. That sounds like a sounds like a plan. <laughs> as much as I joke about never writing again, for me it, it it comes a point where it's almost like you can't help anymore, and I have to vomit it out. There's a topic that is is bugging me uh, currently, but it's it's a matter, of course, of finding the time and and interest to do it. Talk to me a little bit about resources. You know, I, I, we've talked about a few already, obviously your books and website. Is there anything else out there you think is particularly uh, been influential to you, whether it's books or um, websites, concepts, anything else in your in your head, mentors, anything that you think uh, would be helpful to the listeners? Uh, let me see. With the risk of, of um, looking like I'm paid by the guy, but I, I tend to, when I get asked that question, I tend to plug the same guy. I think I actually owe him that anyway, after he helped me out, he wrote a chapter for my latest book as well. Uh, I very much recommend uh, Rob Carver's books. Uh, uh, Rob is a uh, former hedge fund guy in London. He was, uh, I believe, head of, uh, of fixed income trading for AHL for a while. He wrote some incredibly good books about, uh, about systematic trading, particularly for his first book, which is actually called Systematic Trading. I hear he's got a new book coming out, I believe, next month. Oh, I don't know much about it yet. But... Yeah, I'm waiting for that one, but I think that's it's rare to see somebody with the background of the industry background writing this kind of insights, and that's why I pay attention. It's uh, you know after after a while you get to know a lot of the the, um, the fellow authors in the field, and and it's very rare to see somebody who had that high level background who still wrote books about it, and that I can very much recommend. Cool. That's a great one. I I know I've uh, I've seen it. I don't recall ever reading it. He's got another one too. That's smart portfolios. Okay. Yeah, I knew it was something similar title, but not quite quite the same. And I believe the uh, third one coming up soon, which I have not yet read, is about uh, leveraged trading. So basically, higher risk trading, more retail oriented. I believe. Oh well, that's interesting. Uh, that's a topic we get consistently. I think nothing gets the Pavlovian lands going for uh for investors then uh leverage the big the big wins so uh that'll be curious to see his take on it the, the hard part for most most people is you need to avoid it but uh we'll, we'll see what he uh, comes up with that'll be fun and i and you're uh supposedly i think i saw on twitter or somewhere else that uh jack schwager schwager i always pronounce it incorrectly is working on a new new market wizards book too so. Yeah, exactly. I saw it as well. Yeah, uh, to be uh, to be perfectly honest, his name always confuses me as well because I uh, it's not my native language, but I do speak German, so I, I tend to pronounce it in a German way, and that's probably not. It means brother-in-law, by the way, in German. But I'm always confused because of the the uh, German spelling of the name, but as an American, so I, I wouldn't say for sure. <laughs> Sorry, Jack. Hey, well, look, you, Jack, Andreas, Meb. I think we all we we all have the same struggles with names. I get uh every time I go to get coffee in the morning, I get a different variant of my first name. I feel like I just need a pseudonym at this point. I should just start saying Bob. As you look back on your career, what's been your most memorable investment? Good, bad, in between, anything come to mind as uh as seared in your brain? Yeah, actually, I I do have a good one for you. I've got a good one for you. Remember, uh, let me see, how many years ago was that? You know, you, you start getting old, you lose track of years. You remember, was it like four years ago when the Swiss peg broke? There was a, yeah. The Swiss was was, uh, was capped to the uh, to the euro. They were holding the uh, 1.2 line, remember? Mm -hmm. So the, this was, story starts one day before. I mean, now we had, uh, how long was it? A year or something? We had... The rate between our currency over here, I mean, obviously I'm based in Switzerland, the rate between our, our Swiss currency and the euro was, was pretty much fixed at 1.2. The central bank, Swiss central bank held the line there. They spent a fortune holding that line. Now, this was a day before it broke. And this was, well, I guess you could call it a trade. I had to make a larger personal transfer from Swiss to dollar. 
And unfortunately for me, I had this amount in the wrong bank. Not the, the not the bank that I had some leverage over where I can you know, push push rates and push conditions, but I had it in the wrong bank. The bank couldn't really care less about me. And I'm calling them up, I'm checking because obviously e-banking is not the way you do these things. And they give me a rate that's absolute disaster. I mean, we're talking 3% spread, something ridiculous, right? I tried to explain my way up the chain, talk to next guy, next guy, try to explain. And I get more and more people telling me that, no, you don't understand, sir. We don't have any fees on currency conversions. Like, no, of course you don't. You have spreads. This conversation got on my nerves. I think I got more and more upset. I, I yelled my way up the ladder. Well, I probably was fairly polite, but in the end, I just lost my temper. I figured these people don't they don't understand. Either they, they don't understand how much money they're stealing from me on this transaction, or they pretend not to understand. I, I can't deal with this. I, I totally lost my temper in the end. I, I slammed the phone down. I figured, you know, tomorrow I just I just transfer this amount to a bank where I can do business, a bank where where, where I had some more clout. I do the transfer there uh, between the currencies and transfer it out to the States. Now, the next morning I show up in the office, I figured, no, leave it overnight. I just got too upset spending, I don't know, two hours on the phone yelling at people over this. So I, I just left it. I went home. I thought, it can wait a day. Next day I show up, I look at the screens. You know, I was pissed for 3% spread. Next day I look at the screens and the spread changed in my favor, 33 0%. And we're talking a major FX conversion rate changed three zero percent overnight. Yeah, I was pretty happy that day. That's so funny. Just think, just think if you went back, looking back upon it, the guy had caved in. <laughs> let let's say, okay, we'll waive it. Let you make the let you make the transfer. You transfer and then miss it. <laughs> yeah, oh, how yeah. much? That would have ruined my day. That would have ruined my year. I mean, this is one of the best trades I, I did that year. You know, it's it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, I mean. I guess if there's any sort of logic in this, any sort of lesson in this is that one, well, sometimes your best trades are from dumb, stupid luck. Uh, I guess that's that's a theme we, we can see quite a lot. I probably have many of the stories with, uh, with good things happening from dumb luck and bad things happening from skill. The other thing, obviously, if you're looking at uh, more, more, uh, more serious, uh, less frivolous trading lessons here would be um, if you have a situation like that. Here we had a one-sided cap, right? The pressure is all on one side. You have a central bank artificially protecting the line on one side. I mean, everybody know, knew before, and it was clear. The day they stop protecting it, there's going to be a major, major move, right? Everybody knew that. And still, people took risk on the wrong side. I mean, you saw later on some trend-following shops, for instance, who lost a lot of money because they took on massive positions in a trend-following model on a market that moved tiny cents up and down, right? with almost no volatility at the time because central banks were keeping it down. So, I mean, the lesson here from a more serious point of view is that if you apply standard models, and standard models would tell you, one, take a position, two, take a massive position because there's almost no volatility, right? What we do mostly in the business is we take volatility parity type of positions. So something has low volatility, you take it a very big position size because otherwise that position has no possibility to impact the bottom line result, right? So later when you saw that some funds lost enormous amounts because they took massive positions on the wrong side of an artificially inflated asset, and they didn't take into account that the volatility, the low volatility is also artificially created by a central bank. You know, I'm certainly not saying you should predict it and take the opposite side here and bet on the bank failing, but if you take on massive bets that basically say that the bank will never, the central bank will never stop defending that line. And you have a problem. So bottom line is don't always follow your rules. Use some sort of common sense in special situations. It reminds me of the old Soros and, and Sterling trade, you know, where you outlined a very clear example of, of why that stress and pressure builds up. And uh, even better example of knowing some sort of situation that is outside of the quantitative rules could really save your hide. And that applies to everything. You know, people are always asking, when would you, you know, alter your systems? When would you trade something? And, and in my mind, that's something that whether or not you change your system, at least is something to be very aware of. And a lot of people, not just in this example, but many, many other examples get, get 
carried out in body bags because of these situations where they either just completely ignore it or just assume yeah. that it would never change. And yeah, history did. It's exactly the same situation as, as the, the Stalin situation. You had a similar in my, my home country as well. Uh, it was back before I left. Did you had a similar situation in the the, uh, the Swedish Krona as well? But if, if you have a situation where a central bank is artificially doing something against the pressure of the market, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of time. While we're on that topic, and then we'll we'll have to let you go. What what is a on the boots European perspective for what's going on? How are most people, or how are you thinking about? currencies and interest rates in uh, 2019, because I think if we went back in time 10, 20, 30 years and uh, we're having a chat over a pint or something and said, you know, the future is going to be one where a lot of sovereigns have negative yields. And even I think some corporates now, that seems like a pretty odd future for for the finance, finance textbooks. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any just thoughts, uh, general um, comments to make on on the way the world looks? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there are a lot of problems on the horizon at the moment. Uh, one, obviously, is negative yields. I mean, a lot of Americans would say that negative yields are not possible over here, and I'd say, well, the Swiss disagree. Uh, we had them for a while. It is possible. You guys are a bit further ahead, further away than than over over on this side of the pond, of course. But negative yields is a problem and the problem is how to get away from it how to move away from negative yield once you're there you're stuck you got the tab you got the tiger by the tail and now what do you do you hold on uh, how do we slowly let go of this that's going to be a major issue that's one issue the other issue of, of obviously that we see uh, is just bad for everybody in the long run is uh, the uh, the brexit disaster story and the um, together with the the um, increasing risk of global trade wars. I mean, it's not a matter of political opinion, but rather economic opinion that these kind of things are just not good for the markets, they're not good for the economy, they're not good for the business. So there's a lot of problems. Uh, in the end, uh, you asked about currencies as well. You can say that the dollar has a lot of problems, and I agree with that, but which major currency out there has less problems than the dollar? <laughs> you guys have a lot of problems, but uh, point me to a major currency that has less problems than your currency and currencies are is a relative game so sometimes it's not the best currency but the least worst currency that performs we certainly have a lot of challenges in the year up ahead that's for sure yeah yeah i, I was just over in uh the uk earlier this year and, and needless to say uh the mood was was quite a bit dour i, I couldn't even really get anyone to give me a coherent <laughs> example of how this all even potentially works out it was so confusing to me but anyway we're we're owners of of some shares there so i'm uh the all of the bad times tend to create uh, opportunity on the value side for guys like us andreas where can people find more if they want to learn more about you uh follow what you're up to get in touch with you uh where do they go uh yeah well go to my my blog if you still call that uh, my website following the trend.com one word and there's a contact form there as well uh, you can contact me there i try to be a pretty accessible guy i try to you know try to interact with people who read the books and this kind of thing so yeah feel, feel free to contact me and if you happen to be in in singapore in uh, november 26 or melbourne the Saturday after, whatever that is, uh, 31st, something like that, feel free to come and chat with me there. I'm, I'm doing Singapore and Melbourne in, in a few weeks. Very cool. Also, check out his books, listeners, Following the Trend, and his new one, Trading Evolved. Andreas, thanks for uh, joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Listeners will post show note links at mebfavor.com forward slash podcast of the books, of some of the things we talked about today, other books, white papers, etc. Just subscribe to the show on iTunes. Leave us a review. We'd love to hear what you have to say and shoot us feedback at the mebfavorshow.com. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing.